this is uh, a final meeting before September of the Westchester County Rent Guidelines Board to uh, go have uh, rebuttal statements from the tenants and the owner board members to the statements that were made last week. They'll be 10 minutes each, uh, divided up uh, however they choose. I think it's appropriate that because the tenants went first last week, they will go last this week unless they want to agree with the uh, owners on something else. Uh, after which we will uh, have a brief recess, five minutes or so, and then come back and start uh, a discussion. I assume one, somebody will make a motion, and we'll discuss the motion and have a vote. And uh, you've all seen that process before, I think, or at least uh, almost all of you have. Uh, let me first... Uh, Introduce the board members who are present. Eddie Mae Barnes, public member on all the way down to my left. Ken Finger, uh, owner member. Carol Ann Cope, owner member. Elsa Rubin, uh, ten, I'm sorry, public member. Genevieve Roche, uh, tenant member. Emma Jean Lofton Woods, tenant member. I'm Jane Morgenstern, public member, of course. Uh, April Gray Huertas, our council, Chuck Wesnick, uh, the deputy council of the division. Is Woody Pascal here, deputy commissioner yes. Pascal? Well, oh, he's, in he's way in the back in the corner. He's a, an extra special guest tonight, uh, as well as Michael Rosenblatt, who just can't seem to stay away. Uh, He's down here, oh, and nice. Howard Gresham, our uh, court reporter. So without further ado, let me, unless there's some ado that I have omitted, uh, let me call uh, the owners to the microphone to make their presentation. capital improvement cost 
actually is a cost to the owner when he makes it or she makes it uh, at that time in out-of-pocket money, but they don't get it back for at least seven years under depreciation, and even if the MCI is allowed, it's seven years plus the cost of interest. Uh, the closest ratio to approximate cash flow would include interest and depreciation, but among other things, it doesn't include income taxes either. The last table in section one of Ms. Rose's presentation shows in the first column that the cost to income ratio, including interest and depreciation for 2013, was the second worst ratio since 1992 at 90.51%. And during the past 20 years, it's ranged from 82 to 88%. And uh, moreover, if you look at the presentation by Timothy Collins, which is the last item, number 10, in Ms. Roche's presentation, he, uh, on page 3, and I quote, it, he says, if it rises, and he's talking about the cost to income ratio, operating costs will eat up a larger portion of each rent dollar collected, end quote. And that is exactly what has happened here, that the cost to income ratio has gone up over the last year, at least one and a half percent. And uh, then Collins, again a tenant attorney and tenant representative, goes on to admit that the inflationary factor affecting such items as oil, labor, and insurance costs, not even considering real estate taxes, which we know go up yearly, have to be recaptured in rent increases to simulate normal market conditions. This is Mr. Collins, and this is the tenant's own testimony that these costs have to be recaptured. Therefore, by their own analysis, it doesn't uh, support Ms. Uh, Roche's own analysis as to cost and income. Next, when we go to population, presumably tenants suffering from uh, an increasing employment rate, if you look at the charts, which are, I believe, in item four or item five, the last three pages, uh, in item tab four, show that unemployment has significantly decreased over the last month or two, to its lowest level in five years for Mount Vernon, Yonkers, and New Rochelle, the lowest level of unemployment. In tab six of Ms. Rush's presentation, the tenants state that Westchester has one of the highest number of people in poverty, ignoring the fact that this is based on the population, which in Westchester is rather large, while ignoring the percentage in, uh, that, uh, that, uh, in poverty in that chart which shows that Westchester is actually, percentage-wise, one of the lowest in the state, 53rd of 62. And going to the commensurate rate formula of <coughs> members of the board, the tenants do everything they can to dispute this. As DHCR pointed out, it was our late colleague, Mr. Joseph, who requested this formula last year and then voted for a 3 and 4 percent increase. We submit that the formula is one that is the only logically statistical formula that has been presented. It puts the owner in the same position in real dollars when you consider the CPI, so that the appropriate increase will be 4 and 7 percent, not considering vacancies, or up to 3 and, two, uh, and a quarter percent for two years with vacancies. Should be. This is the amount that will be allowed, that should be allowed to the owners to be in the same position in real dollars as last year. When the tenants take the 2013 income of 261000 and increase it to 274000 they say to, it counts the deregulated apartments. However, the instructions for DHCR clearly state that the revenues that are included by the landlords and owners actually include the revenues from deregulated apartments. So in adding this number in, the tenants are double counting and double dipping. This is blatantly incorrect information we submit calculated to mislead this board into not giving the owners the increase that they deserve. Uh, again, the analysis is flawed. The tenants then add additional rent for vacant apartments using the vacancy tables included in the uh, included in the DHCR handout. Uh, of course, as we've told the board, these represent legal regulated rents and are not the actual rents that people pay, which the DHCR is called preferential rents. And we all know that there are many rents that are preferential rents, and you can't say that the landlords are making the money that the tenants say they're making, because again, we're double counting, and it's overstating the income. The so-called statistical analysis is, 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 
repeatedly flawed and is frequently based on unsubstantiated data. There are many other uh, areas of the presentation by attendants where the facts do not support the tenant's analysis, such as the Cranes article, which actually talks about Manhattan on the 96th Street. We all know Manhattan on the 96th Street is another world. It's not Westchester County. Uh, ETPA actually is a subsidy to the tenants, uh, and many of whom can afford more, have fancy cars, have second houses at the Jersey Shore, the Hamptons, and the like. Further, state controller's report, which says that single-family owners of single-family houses are even more burdened than uh, the ETPA, uh, ETPA uh, renters. The, uh, the omission of this report, we would submit, is very telling. The, in the past five years alone, in terms of affordable housing, there have been five to six new buildings between 50 and 70 units built in the office for senior citizens. A new building is going up in New Rochelle, and you have Leviston Towers in Mount Vernon that has hundreds and hundreds of affordable apartments for uh, not only seniors, but for the general population. Uh, the final thing is the heating analysis cost is flawed in considering only prices and not in usage. The, uh, in order to have a legitimate analysis, uh, if you looked at the tenant's presentation, it talks about the, uh, that fuel oil dropped in 2008, but doesn't reference the fact that it's raised, it's risen in every year since 2008. We would submit that, uh, that the, uh, that the problems that the landlords and owners have now is a product of the fact that a year or two ago, three years or four years ago, we had extremely low increases, which has affected repairs, and the tenants uh, have complained about the lack of repairs. Okay, I'm just not done. Uh, Ms. Roche has asked that we have a balanced approach. We ask that that approach be balanced in terms not only of the rent increase, but in terms of a low guideline which would help prevent the, uh, prevent the further skewing of rents. So we would ask that again, a 4 and 6 percent, and a $40 and $60 increase be granted to the landlords to have an equity guideline that includes uh, lower paying tenants and uh, equalizes them so that costs are more justly uh, stabilized. Thank you very much. I didn't get everything. I know. <laughs> I only got 80% of it. Mm -hmm. right. Stop. Thank you. I was only 25 seconds old. Huh? That's not too bad. Okay. It's because I have my stopwatch. Mm -hmm. to respond to the several comments made by the owner reps in their presentations, but there are some essential corrections that Emma and I uh, believe need to be pointed out this evening before the board undertakes uh, a vote. Uh, the first is expenses and net operating income. All the talk of particular expenses is still missing the point. Various expenses change from year to year, but that is irrelevant unless viewed in the context of its effect on net operating income. The numbers show that expenses were up only 2.29% over two years, but that NOI remained consistently solid at close to 35%. Three points. Owner board reps keep saying they're entitled to a fair profit. It is something in the range of 33 to 35%, not good enough? Second point. 
When they say that owners have to go into their own pocket, what they really mean is that they don't want to cut into their own profit wealth. Third, when the owner board reps say that we should forget the surveys, I could not agree more. I've been saying for years that the surveys are not accurate, they are voluntary, partial responses reporting unaudited numbers. If we want to get real about this exercise that we do every year, the numbers should be tied to finance department tax returns, which we, where we can see actual levels of net income being made per year. But the current system is what we have to work with, and my analysis shows but the tip of the iceberg of increased income being made. Second point. Uh, I'd like to address what Mr. Finger called in his presentation last week, the bugaboo regarding vacancies, significant contribution to profit, and the continuing decline in the number of ETPA apartments through deregulation. In his handout addressing vacancies, the first paragraph, the first three lines, is misconstrued. He's referring to apartments vacant at the time of the registration. They're still in the system, so that argument is not really relevant. Secondly, his first paragraph, lines four to five, does address permanently exempted apartments now renting at market rates, the number of which, Mr. Finger says, is declining. Well, that makes sense and underscores the tenant's argument. Of course, there would be fewer absolute number of units that become permanently decontrolled and leave the system as the total number of rent-stabilized units declines year after year. But at almost 8% of ETPA apartments leaving the system last year, every fraction of a percentage of a guideline increase that you enact will push that many more apartments out of the system. Please also note that the almost 8% lost in 2013 is no doubt a reflection of this board's judicious decision to enact one and a quarter and two and a quarter increases in that were in effect in 2013, which helped stem the flow. You are to be commended for doing your job to protect affordable housing, particularly as owners of that year saw an almost 35% net operating income. If you look at the DHCR handout, extra copies of which I've handed out, you can see that in the years 2009 through 12, the rates of loss were 20%, 18%, 21% and 14%. A loss of 5,450 apartments, or 17.3% in four years. However, in 2014, with the excessive 3 and 4% increases that were enacted, we are guaranteed to see the absolute number of vacancy decontrolled apartments back up, close to the five-year average of almost 500 units a year. Without the board's firm handle on this, we will see the number of apartments resume its precipitous decline. Last point on this topic. Mr. Finger's second paragraph on vacancies addresses vacancy allowances. First and foremost, it is disingenuous to say that the number is not substantial because the rent stayed within a $500 a month range. As he concedes, 75% of one-year vacancies and 70% of two-year vacancies are renting at between 5 and 20% higher rents. Just look at the median increases the DHCR uh, statistics show uh, at my tab one for the vacancies in the last year, which generated an estimated additional $7.2 million for owners. I think we can all agree that there is nothing insubstantial about that. Also, I'd like to point out that 26% of the units, or more than 6,500, are renting for more than $1,500 a month, and that is compared to only 20% of the units two years ago, or a little over 5,000. Again, every fraction of a percentage pushes that many more apartments one vacancy away from deregulation. My third major point that I would like to address. My third major point that I would like to address is the owner's statement that they need the $40 and $60 flat dollar increases on apartments renting for less than $1,000 a month since they are subsidizing these rents. First and foremost, we've previously addressed that rent stabilization 
is not a subsidy. It's addressed every year in my materials. And it's the law to address the chronic shortage of affordable housing units to prevent rent gouging. Second, less than 9,000 rent-stabilized units rent for less than $1,000 a month, which means we are talking about 7% of the more than 126,000 rental units in Westchester County. These are the very people the law was designed to protect. I think it would be fair to say that those 8,800 tenants are more in need of that $40 and $60 a month than the owners who will still realize a 33% net operating income even if we enact a rent freeze, even without that extra $4 to $6 million in their pockets from the flat tax. There are a couple of... How much time do I have left? Right, no. Thank you very much. In which case, I will address some of points uh, as rebuttal. Um, first of all, the owners keep talking year after year about owners having to sell their buildings, but this year is no exception. We have not seen any documentation or statistics on how many ETPA buildings are being sold, the sales of which are directly attributable to rent guideline in increases. Rather, the evidence is to the contrary that there is serious profit to be made in selling or converting a building owned, for example, for 30 years, to realize the net appreciation of dollars per square foot, particularly in the current market. Second point, the PIOC and commensurate formula. Addressed in my materials, but I just want to underscore, since Mr. Finger raised it in his presentation, I do hope you read Tim Collins' excellent testimony explaining why this is no longer a credible or valid formula. Using the CPI is not accurate, as it reflects prices, not actual expenditures, is not fact-based, and has been rejected by the DHCR, DHCR statisticians, including our own Mr. Alba. Um, and then I'm going to just hit very brief, briefly on a couple of points that Mr. Finger raised tonight. Um, he keeps insisting that depreciation and interest are not real ex that are, are real expenses and should be calculated into the net operating income, uh, cost income ratio. Um, this has been, ad again, addressed in my materials every year. These are not operating ex expenses, they're not properly considered, and that is why the DHCR statisticians, statisticians do not include them when they produce their cost income ratio tables. They're in the law. Okay, the next point, unemployment, uh, they touch on unemployment having decreased. I, I handled this thoroughly in my presentation and in my materials. It's still substantially below 2007 levels. Poverty, uh, Mr. Finger um, disingenuously talks about Westchester County, which we know is a rich county, but let's face it, folks, 74% of the rent-stabilized apartments are in the three towns where the poverty level is hovering at 15%. Um, and then finally, I am absolutely not double counting. And also, please don't interrupt me while I'm speaking, I'd appreciate it. Um, I am not double counting. This is not unsubstantiated data. All of my calculations are based on the data that the DHCR provided to us that they got directly from the owners. So with that, I would like to say that um, I, I, I really believe that given the excessive increases last year, countered with the, um, the demographics, countered with the fact that net operating income remains high, in large part due to vacancy decontrol and vacancy allowances, and as I pointed out last week, as the years go by and we lose more and more apartments to deregulation and higher rents through vacancy allowances, we as a board can enact smaller and smaller increases in the rent guideline percentages and still allow the owners to recoup a consistent level of profit. Thank you very much. Okay. Maybe next we're we're going to take um, 
a, a break for five or six minutes and uh, then come back. I will ask for a motion, and at that point, I think uh, discussion among the board members, including if they wish questions to mm -hmm. the makers of the motion, uh, will be entertained. Did you actually move the motion? No. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Wait, you just did. Uh, I said, when we come back, when we come back, we'll, we'll have a motion uh, on the guidelines. Uh, Executive. Okay. We're going to resume our uh, meeting, and I'm going to ask uh, that we get a motion from uh, somebody on the board so that we can begin uh, our discussions as to the guidelines. Can I have a motion? On. She wants the number. Mr. Finger, yes. Ms. Cope, Ms. Roth, Ms. Lofton Woods, Reverend Lofton Woods. Well, I'll make the motion that, which I have made in my presentation, that the guidelines be increased by 4% for one year, 6% for two years, associated with a $40 and $60 minimum increase for one year and two year guidelines. Is there a second? Oh, oh. seconded by uh, Alan Lance Cope. Uh, board members, discussion? We never discuss. Yeah. Just never discussion. My concern is. Um, that with the 4% for one year and the 6% for two years, and I know that uh, the owners, you know, based on the information that you presented, that uh, they have um, costs that have risen. Um, but in spite of that, they were able to realize 33, somewhere in that area, um, profit. And one of the things that we weren't taking into consideration is with the economy the way it is, it is definitely affecting the tenants. And somehow in that figure, or those figures, I don't see that it's taking that into consideration. And that's a real concern for me. Okay. Yeah, can I answer that? Uh, and I, I appreciate that, that concern. First of all, I think what you're doing is you're buying into the arguments that have, that have been made by the tenants over the years that the cost to income ratio is profit. That, that isn't profit. That's, that is at best when you look at that, not considering interest, which is a real expense. And if you don't have depreciation, depreciation is what the landlords use to get money together so that they can build up a fund for capital improvements and capital repairs. When you look at that number, you're left with maybe 10%, the first column, not the third column. The third column doesn't consider interest. You can't, you can't buy a building without borrowing money. And there's a, there's a real cost of interest and a real cost of depreciation, and that's in the first column. And even that 9 or 10% shows, according to Mr. Collins' own testimony, that there is less dollars for the landlords to use by virtue of the fact that it's gone up uh, up one and a half percent this year, the or the, the number, which means there's that much less uh, there's that much less money for the tenant landlords to uh, to have as as expense. So I don't think you know, I, I think the tenants own ratio ratios and Mr. Collins own testimony that uh, if it rises, which it has, 1.5%, operating costs will eat up a larger portion of each rent dollar collected. That's from Tim Collins, and that mm -hmm. was given to you in Ms. Roche's presentation. So I think you have to, you know, I, I understand where you're coming from, but the real number now is 90.51%, and that doesn't include the fact that of a lot of the money that's left, the 8 to 9% that's left from, from this number, a lot of that number is laid out out of pocket in advance 
for both major capital improvements mm -hmm. that are reimbursed and not reimbursed. And you have a lot, the statistics show that a lot of the capital improvements mm -hmm. you do not get MCIs for. So, and so finally you're left with some percentage, and yes, is it wrong to expect somebody who is investing in real estate to get a profit? Is that something that is un-American? You're not going to get people investing unless you guarantee them a profit. Nobody gets into any business without expecting some type of reasonable profit. So, yes, I understand where your argument is coming from, and yes, the economy, though, also affects the landlords. Mm -hmm. uh, taxes true. go up, insurance went up, uh, uh, oil went up, water went up in Yonkers. Mm -hmm. you're, you're in Greenberg, so you don't know. This we deal in Yonkers. Everything goes up significantly. You've been, you've been going on for a while, and I, I have a feeling that somebody is going to want to rebut that. But after, uh, is it Ms. Roche who's going to uh, talk next in this discussion? After you, you do so, let's try to limit the board members' uh, comments to a couple of minutes each because uh, we will never get out of here tonight if uh, we keep on representing uh, the various positions. But to be fair, thank you, Jane. Um, this is the same discussion we have every year. And as I just said in my rebuttal, board members, depreciation and interest are not operating expenses. And the GHCR statisticians derive their cost to income ratio, excluding that for that very reason. And they, we've explained this year after year. Depreciation is an expense on paper. It's used for tax recapture. Interest varies owner by owner. Some owners own their buildings outright. So that varies. But what we're trying to determine is what is the net operating income? And that excludes those two categories. We're talking about all the items that are itemized in the DHCR data. And that, that shows that the owners, year in and year out, make more income, whatever the expenses are, and the increases yet year after year keep uh, them realizing a consistent and steady net operating income. Okay? Anybody else? Mr. Wheeler? Okay, it's interesting being a public member. No matter what you say, somebody's not going to like it. But uh, I think we know <coughs> to follow the law. As far as depreciation, it's interesting in any accounting book, and I've been down that road for three decades teaching it. Depreciation as a line item is considered a non-cash item. But you can't say it's not an operating expense. And the reason is, in order to have apartments, you have to buy a building. Now, that's an expense. And you'll take it over a certain number of years for tax purposes. But it's definitely an operating expense. It's not the exact number, because that's often calculated formulas and years and assumptions. But what's happening is a check is written every month to a, a mortgagee, person that offered the mortgage, and that doesn't show up in the numbers. But it, it, it's a second best thing, depreciation. It's definitely, I mean, how, do, how are you going to have apartments without a building? Come on. So depreciation is an operating expense. Interest is way more challenging. Uh, owners are sometimes enticed into building buildings for the public. That's who the public members represent, the public. We want affordable housing. I don't believe I believe the main thing in the law is to prevent rent gouging. We got to watch out for landlord gouging. If you sit back and say, and I don't, I don't believe it's in the law, that we're allowed to say, look, Mr. Landlord, you had, uh, you put in laundromats and parking, and you had this change and that change, you added revenue. We want to look at net. I don't think it's in the law. I think. The requirement is to show that there's no rent gouging and that expenses went up. And I went back four years, and we're not reimbursing landlords adequately. I mean, there's got to be a reason why units go from 43000 to 29000 And I don't want to believe that this board has anything to do with eliminating what are the most affordable places to live 
in, in the county. And all I could say is I know many people that can't afford the house or the kids are out. They want to find apartments. We want to encourage the, those apartments staying in the marketplace. So we can't deny reasonable, proven cost increases going into the guideline. to that. As a building depreciates out, if anything, you would see net operating income decline, and yet it stays consistent. That is not so. It's absolutely not so. Statistically not so. Statement has no bearing. I call the question. No, Remember, I can't can call the question. Yes, we can call the question. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, in April to uh, Caroline hold the board. Yes. What would you want to read? Just read the motion first, okay? Uh, the motion is for a guideline for 4% or $40 per apartment, whichever is greater for one year lease, and 6% or $60, whichever is greater for a two year lease. The adjustments to be applicable to the ETPA renewal leases, which commenced between October 1st, 2014 and September 30th, 2015. Caroline Hope? In favor. Ken Finger? Yes. Joe Wellen? No. What did he say? No. Elsa Rubin? No. Emma Jean Lofton? No. Eddie Mae Barnes? No. Genevieve Roach? No. With two affirmative votes, the motion fails. Do we have another motion? Ms. Roach? On behalf of the tenants, um, I would like to propose, based on all the material and analysis that I have provided, uh, uh, rent increase guidelines of 0.5% for one year. 1% for two year and no fixed uh, fixed rate increases. Will I hear a second? I'll second. Seconded by Board Discussion? Board members? Somebody call? Okay. I'll call questions. She doesn't want to hear me again. Uh, She's just there's, there's an, if there's no discussion, we'll just proceed to a vote. Um, let me ask you, um, April, can you read not always in the same order when you call the board? I think uh, we've tried sure, that in the past. Sometimes bottom up, sometimes top okay. down. Sure. Yes. Genevieve Roach? In favor. Eddie Mae Barnes? No. Emma Jean Lofton? Favor. Elsa Rubin? No. Joe Wellen? No. Ken Finger? No. Caroline Holt? No. Two affirmative votes. Ms. Barnes? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were raising your hand. I'm thinking we need, are we going to discuss or can I make a motion? You can make a motion. Okay. Recess. Recess. All right. Okay. All things considered, as far as I can see, uh, with the presentations from both the uh, the tenants and the uh, the owners, and in trying to be fair to both, I move that we have. Um, a one and a half percent increase for one year leases and two and a half percent for two year leases with no fixed rate increases. I second. 
When you say fixed grade, I just want to clarify. I assume you mean no with what the uh, no the, the forty and referring to a low rent uh, a low rent right a, a low rent guideline right you know, a percentage or whichever is greater no okay discussion well I, I want to say something about if uh, nobody else is going to say anything right now about the the low rent guideline um, you know we've done this a number of times in the past we did it. Again, last year, I, I really am not, I think it may have been, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, three times in the past eight or nine years, is that correct? The, the, a low rent guideline, in other words, a percentage or whichever is greater. Um, I don't think this is something that should be institutionalized in, in our guidelines. You know, every now and then, I agree that it's important to try to bring some measure of equality, not complete equality, but to, to work things out so that the, uh, there, the um, separation between the sort of low rent payers and the much higher rent payers just doesn't increase and increase and increase, which of course is uh, what tends to happen. And I think that's why, from time to time, uh, we, the board, the majority of the board, has agreed to do a low rent guideline. But really, when you analyze it, for instance, I mean, I'm not great at math, but for instance, a 4% increase on $500 a month would be $20 a month. Um, well, if the owners were to have what they wanted in the way of a low rent guideline, that is to say $40, that would be double the percentage increase that they asked for. In other words, an 8% increase. And you can extrapolate these numbers, you know, to fit any of the guidelines that are proposed. I don't think that's fair or reasonable to uh, continually uh, burden uh, and I use the word advisedly, people who have usually been living for a long, long time in their uh, rent-regulated apartments, which is why their rents tend to be lower than those who haven't. Uh, I believe that they tend to be older people, people on Social Security, people who, for a variety of reasons, don't really have the kind of money that uh, many others do and who can afford to pay higher. In any event, uh, I just wanted to make that comment, which is why I am not in favor this year of a uh, low rent guideline. Mr. Finger. Yeah, I, I respectfully disagree. Uh, I, I, you're, you're making assumptions where there are absolutely no statistics to, uh, to verify those assumptions. You have no idea on the uh, uh, socioeconomic breakdown of the tenants, period, uh, nor the economic mm -hmm. income breakdown of the tenants. We, we just don't know that. It's not a number that is collected by DHCR, nor can it be collected by DHCR. And for every anecdotal person that you know that has a problem with that, I know someone that doesn't have a problem and is living there for many years, uh, taking advantage having a fancy summer house, and, and getting away that's, with it. That's what it what, that statement that you made earlier was yes. one of the reasons that I, I brought that up. You're I, right. I understand your, that. Your points have been anecdotal, as have most I, I, that, That's exactly my we, point. We've had a lot of testimony from, from tenants and tenant representatives, uh, much more so than uh, people occupying... Uh, higher rent apartments. I mean, I don't want to get into a dispute about this. You're right, it's anecdotal. Um, but there are a lot of tenants who have testified at our hearings who uh, have described uh, tenants in their buildings who are uh, really what I think was referred to as rent burdens uh, by Dennis Hanray, among other cost burdens. Cost burdens, I was just correct. Uh, any other discussion on the motion, which is for 1.5% and 2.5%? Mr. Wheeler. Thanks. 
Okay, regarding that uh, pretty controversial topic, I wish we had more data on that so-called, uh, I'm calling it the equitable low rent amount. And if someone is in a $500 month apartment, to use the chair's example, then uh, if they're spending 30% of their income on, on rent, then they have to be earning basically $1,600 a month. Now, two retired people on Social Security can go to the high 30,000s, so we got to be careful that our only prototype tenant is, you know, like what was already discussed, so I'm not going to go into it again. I mean, in 29,000 apartments, I don't think we're hurting anybody with a low rent guideline, and if the board wishes, we, maybe we could take it $10 a month off or something. But it's so inequitable to, particularly the smaller building owners, and we hear testimony there too. I mean, I don't look at statistics about the economy because someone else will look at statistics about average income in Westchester, or we don't have any information, as Mr. Finger said, about individual circumstances other than some tenants have this problem, some landlords have that problem. I do know that the smaller landlords are hurt the most because they don't have the economy to scale, obviously, the two, three, four hundred unit buildings. So I see that low rent e equitable adjustment as important. I just wanted to make that point. Well, I just, I, I think now I just want to point out that maybe we've gone a little bit too far in this whole discussion. Um, and I'm the one who's mm -hmm. guilty of that. But we don't have a means test. Yeah, and it's not a part of the motion. To, uh, to remember, I believe, for everybody to remember. Uh, any further discussion on this motion by uh, Ms. Barnes? Again, Ms. Rowe. one sentence. I just want to point out to balance what Mr. Whelan's been saying is 24, uh, excuse me, 29% of the ETPA apartments uh, are in Mount Yonkers, uh, Mount Vernon, excuse me. Um, twenty nine percent of the apartments are there and they represent twenty nine percent excuse me, twenty nine percent of all Westchester apartments are in these three towns mm -hmm. and they represent seventy four percent of all the rent stabilized apartments. And I think I've I've produced some pretty compelling data from numerous government sources showing what the level of poverty is. Uh, and level of unemployment in those three towns. And I think we can all extrapolate from that. However, what we don't have, and we should get, is the actual, not surveys, of 67% of the owners, mm -hmm. but the actual uh, finance department of New York State uh, and Westchester County that shows exactly what the income is for these owners. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, in terms of the unemployment rate, I'm looking at Ms. Roche's own figures, which show in Yonkers, 5.7%, which is the lowest since 2008, in Mount Vernon, and this is from her thing, 6.7%, which is the lowest since 2008, and I guess New Rochelle, New Rochelle, 5.4%, which is also the lowest since 2008. So the unemployment has gone way, way down in those communities. There's no problem, there's a problem, but that problem exists for landlords too. Anybody else? Okay, thank you. Yes. Motion for guideline rent adjustment of one and one and a half percent for one year. Right. One, one and a half. 1.5. 1. 1. Yeah, one and a half. Two and a half. 1.5 for a one-year renewal lease and 2.5 for a two-year renewal lease starting October 1st, 2014 through September 30th, 2015. Elsa Rubin? Yes. Eddie May Barnes? Yes. Genevieve Roach? Yes. Emma Lofton Woods? Yes. Caroline Cope? No. Joe Wellen? No. Ken Finger? No. Jane Morgenstern? Yes. Motion carries five to three. Guidelines set at one and a half. Um, we still have, we still have, Mr. 
to the, we have to do the, uh, the guidelines for uh, those DCPA apartments which, uh, in which the tenants pay for the heat and hot water. Um, there is a formula that's been used, uh, to the best of my knowledge, since time immemorial. Uh, is there a motion that we... 80%. Well, it's, uh, 80%, Joe. Okay, so then it's 80% of the... 1.2 uh, and 2. Okay. We're better off with the tenants. Would that be 1.2 and 2? I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, double check. I mean, it's a double check. Yeah. I hope I can convince you otherwise next year. <laughs> What, 1.5 times places? Yeah. Wow. Well, it wasn't as low as they wanted, but I, I think so. I, I, I think it's reasonable. I think, it, I think it should have been a little more. Two percent. That's what I would have done. Another question is quiet down. We're, we're not, we haven't concluded our business yet. 1.2 and 2. Yes. Um, can we have a motion that uh, by Ms. Ms. Rubin and seconded by uh, Reverend Watson Woods for uh, a guideline for uh, tenants uh, who pay no for their own heat and or hot water would be 1.2% 1. 2. 1. 2 and two. For a one-year lease and two percent. No, it's eighty percent. Twenty-four six. Is that is that two? Yeah. 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 Right, two percent for two years. Yeah, you're right. They figured it out. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none. No board I'm going to say no, Carol. Ken Finger? No. Joe Wellen? Yes. Elsa Rubin? Yes. Emma Lockton? Yes. Caroline Hope? No. Eddie May Barnes? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm missing two people. Genevieve? Yes. Motion carries five to two. Uh, motion to adjourn. Next Till meeting. When? What? What? Next meeting. Well, so next 16 meeting is going to be in September. That will be the certification. Um, don't believe we have a when is it? date set yet. It will be noticed and September will get a timely notice of that meeting. Did she give a date in September? No, though, we'll, we'll go around. Right right. okay. oh. oh, yeah. Have a nice oh, summer. Yeah. Thank you, too. Yes, there Both are of you. You're going away? No. Which, uh, <laughs> well, I'm going down to Florida. I hope it's nice. I hope so. Yeah. Is there a motion to adjourn to and for this, I missed a good dinner tonight. Are you supposed to go ahead or you made it to the house? Thank you all very much for